And good evening from Denver, Colorado. I am a Chief Meteorologist of Denver 7, Mike Nelson, and I am with Scott Denning, who is a Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at Colorado State University. Uh, Scott, we're going to be seen across many parts of the country tonight because this Facebook live stream is going to be shown on many of our sister stations in cities all over the country. Great. Not to make you feel any yeah. more nervous. It's good. It's good <laughs> and we're talking about global warming and climate change, which is a, an extremely important topic as we uh, think about our children, our grandchildren, our heirs. Right. And uh, it's somewhat of a topic that has some confusion. I think it's a little uh, self-induced confusion, but that's why I have you here to answer it. So I'm going to start out right away. And for folks that are out there, uh, if you have questions, you can just enter them. And I have someone up in the control room that is going to uh, feed us some of those questions. So we'd be happy to, to answer some of those. So one of the questions that I'm oftentimes asked when I go out and speak to a group uh, is, uh, hasn't the climate always changed? Yeah, it has. Um, over the course of the whole history of the Earth, the climate has warmed and it's cooled. Um, and this is really kind of how we know that climate can change, right? Because uh, as you see how much heat it takes to warm the Earth up or how much cooling it takes to cool the Earth off, um, we were able to compare those previous warmings and coolings with the warming and cooling that we're having now. And uh, what we know um, is that uh, 20,000 years ago, it was the middle of an ice age, ter terrible, uh, you know, big ice sheets over uh, much of North America and Europe. And it took 10,000 years for that ice to melt. And uh, we could conceivably warm up the world as much in the next couple of hundred years as that whole 10,000 years of warming coming out of the ice age. So um, it's, it's actually looking at that past warming, the last great big warming that the earth had, um, that has some of us pretty concerned about, about doing that level of warming again. Let's go back and look at a little of the forensics on this, uh, sure. Scott. And, uh, we've only really had records for a couple hundred years. Right. And we've only really had recorded history for maybe 6,000 years. Right. So how are we clever enough to know what happened 180,000 years yeah, ago? Yeah, well, so 180,000 a long time. 20,000 years ago was when this ice was, you know, um, basically from where Hudson's Bay is now in the middle of Canada, all the way down pretty much to where Interstate 80 crosses the United States. So think uh, Chicago, New York, uh, kind of a line along there. And uh, the reason that we know that is because it left big piles of rock and gravel and stuff that it sort of bulldozed down across Canada. And uh, at the end of the ice where it's melting, all this rock and gravel and mud falls out the front of the ice. And this is found all over the Northern Hemisphere. There's this sort of ridges of, of uh, detritus stuff that's terminal just- Terminal moraine. That terminal moraine, exactly right. up in uh, Wisconsin. We hey, learned all about the ice. So, so like <laughs> Long Island, New York right. uh, is part of the terminal moraine. There's this big pile of gravel uh, that's left at the end of the ice. Um, besides that, we've actually got um, pollen from um, plants that, that lived at that time that uh, leave their remains in lakes and, and uh, ponds and stuff like that. Out of the ocean, we've got fossils from the bottom of the ocean that show what kind of creatures were there. Um, actually, here in Boulder, uh, there are ice cores that have been brought back from Antarctica and Greenland. And inside those ice cores is actually fossil air, if you okay. can believe it. R literally, um, bubbles of air that are trapped when snowflakes fall and uh, traps a little pocket of air, and then as the snow piles up deeper and deeper, it you know, squeezes those those bubbles or those uh, pockets until they seal off and make bubbles. Retrieve those cores. Goes back 800,000 years. We've we've got literally air for 800,000 individual years going going way back. So you can tell how much CO2 was in it. You can tell what the temperatures were. It's an amazing uh, science. Speaking of CO2, I get this question a lot. It's a trace gas. I right. mean, it's a few hundred parts per million. How can such a small amount of our atmosphere be so important? Well, um, 400 molecules of CO2 for every million molecules of air. Um, but just to give you an idea of how trace gases can be important, if it was 400 parts per million of carbon monoxide, we'd be dead, right? So a, a little bit of something can certainly make a difference. 99% um, of the air is just two gases, oxygen and nitrogen. Of course, oxygen, you would miss it if you didn't have it. Nitrogen sure. is, is, is just fill gas, <sighs> goes in, <sighs> goes out. 
Uh, but the nitrogen and the oxygen are diatomic molecules, two atoms of the same element, uh, kind of glommed together with um, shared electrons. We call that a chemical bond. And because those um, gases, which form almost the whole air, are identical on either end and just have that one bond, there isn't a lot of way, way you can rearrange that molecule geometrically mm -hmm. in response to, uh, to infrared heat radiation that's coming up from the, from the Earth. Right. CO2 is different. CO2 has three atoms instead of two atoms. Okay. So we only got the two sure, hands. Get your hands up a little to, higher. To, can we do that? Oh, I see. I mean, yeah. I got I to show, show people. So oxygen and nitrogen, like this, uh, two atoms of the same element. CO2, got this for the carbon, <laughs> oxygen, oxygen. So we can do this with a CO2 molecule in response to a photon or an infrared beam. But there's more because it can go like this. Like this, okay. Like this, all these and different. That is creating heat. Well, that what what it, what it does is it, is it absorbs some of the incoming radiation mm -hmm. that's being radiated by the ground. Okay. Does these little wiggles of these molecules? Yeah, you're, you're doing the dance, okay. Mike. You're, right. you're, 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 I have my own dance. You're rocking your it. molecule dance. Yeah. Right? So uh, the molecule dance is absorbing some of that infrared energy instead of propagating out and cooling the planet. It's, it, it's trapped in that molecule, and then it can re-radiate it. If it radiates up, it still cools us, but some of them radiate down, and that keeps us warm. And you've told me in the past that for each doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 200 parts per million to 400, 400, 800, right. the retention of energy is about 4 watts per square meter over the entire surface of the Earth. That's exactly right. So um, It doesn't seem like much, but it's a Christmas tree light. Well, that, uh, you know, when right. you and I were little, those yeah. were Christmas tree lights. Right. Um, probably many of your listeners uh, remember them as night lights, mm -hmm. the 4-watt incandescent light bulbs that um, didn't think to bring one this time. Right. Uh, that you used to use in the hallway to yep. have your kids find the bathroom at night. You could imagine um, one of those four watt light bulbs here and here and here and here, every meter, right, every three feet, covering the whole world. It's and a tremendous amount of energy. And you leave those four watt light bulbs on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for the rest of your life and much, much more. That would warm up the world. Right. And that's what we've had a viewer question come in and say, how can I talk to somebody about global warming when as soon as I do, they click into this is all just politics and uh, this is not, this is just thermodynamics. Well, sure. Um, I mean, we've known for hundreds of years that when you add heat to things, they warm up, right? right. You, you put a pot of water on the stove and you put heat in the bottom of that pot of water and what happens to that water, it warms up. And actually the world works that way too. When the sun comes up in the morning and it, you know, beats on the ground, it warms up. When the days are longer in July and the sun is higher in the sky, it warms up the, the summer. And it's exactly the same physics that causes the CO2 to warm up the world. Regardless of whether you're a red or a blue, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just physics. Well, yeah. and, and you know, uh, these, these watts, these absorption lines were measured 150 years ago. All right, this is not new science. No, 150 years ago, 1863, was that a, a little over 150 yep. years. A um, guy named John Tyndall measured the absorption of uh, infrared heat by CO2 gas right. in a laboratory. Since that, and there were no red and blue, right, at that right. time. Right. Uh, so since that time, um, these measurements have been made thousands of times around the world, better and better instruments. Everybody gets exactly the same answer. There's really no wiggle room around this. Right. So it was so you, when you apply heat to something, it gets warmer. Yeah. Now, a uh, question that I oftentimes will get as a meteorologist is, hey, Mike, you uh, can't even predict tomorrow's weather with 100% certainty. How can you predict the weather 50 or 100 years from now? Very good question. And the reason it, that you can't, well, nothing personal, you know, it's, it's, not, okay. just, it's not just Mike that can't predict the weather. <laughs> I can in, handle it. <laughs> uh, two weeks from now. But uh, the reason that it's, that it's hard to predict the weather um, more than a day or five or 10 in advance, is because weather's all about heat moving around on the Earth, right? From, from uh, we had this cold snap last week, um, that cold air has blown away somewhere else and been replaced by warmer air. So you're trying to predict Chaos. the movements of small bits of air around right. on the planet. When we say the world will warm up when we add four watt light bulbs to every square meter of the planet, 
we're using the same logic that we use when we say it's going to be warmer in July than it is in January, right? When the sun is higher and there's more watts of sunshine beating down on the ground for months and months, it warms up. And you actually can predict that. Uh, yeah, Just you, like Miami is warmer than Denver most of the time. Ma, 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 every year, yeah. Miami is warmer than right. Denver's average. Every summer, uh, Denver's temperature is warmer than every Denver winter on the average. And that's the kind of thing we're predicting right. with global warming. Right. And I guess that's the answer that I've used when people say, if you, in January, wanted to get away from the cold, you would, the climate of Miami would say you buy an airline ticket and head to the beach. Right. Right. Now, you might have bought that ticket, and then when you fly down there, the weather is a cold front you, moves through, you, you and Miami's 45 weather. degrees and raining, and Denver 65 with a Chinook. And I would guarantee you that, that even with global warming, there are still going to be cold days, right, right. in Denver. We, we're still going to have snowstorms and, and so forth, um, but on the average, it'll be warmer. Yeah. We've had a, a, a listener, a viewer, uh, check in and say, what, uh, what kind of things, if you could speak to the people in charge and say, what are the steps that we should take? What's the most prudent course of action to help mitigate the problems that we'll face and solve it? Because you say it's, it's simple, it's serious, and it's solvable. Yeah. Simple, serious, and solvable are my three S's yeah. of climate change. So how, what's the solution part? So, so really what has to happen is that we um, figure out how to uh, live comfortably and, and well with less energy, and we're way better at this than we used to be. So, you know, better doors and windows and air conditioners and light bulbs and roofs and cars and all that kind of stuff. We, we know how to do that stuff. We, uh, we can um, still live well, but use less energy. And then the second part is to take the, the money that you save out of all that, that energy you used to waste that you don't need to waste anymore and apply it towards making energy that doesn't involve setting coal, oil, and gas on fire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, solar power, wind power, hydropower, nuclear power, uh, better grids, better storage of, of energy and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it, half of the solution is energy efficiency. And the other half of the solution is making energy in other ways that don't involve putting CO2 in the air. Right. You've been doing this for a while, Professor Denning. And in the time that you have been an atmospheric scientist and involved in climate issues, what changes have you seen over the last, say, 25 years? In the climate? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the scientific climate yeah. and the government climate, if you will, not in the physical climate. Yeah, okay. Well, um, we have known for a long time, since long before I was born, about CO2 influencing the, the climate and, and warming. Uh, what we have now, of course, is fantastic observations. Uh, we have... Um, a network of, of global observing stations that you use in your forecasting. We have satellites that measure all kinds of uh, parts of the Earth system from space all the time, 24-7. Um, even the oceans. Um, the, the oceans, you know, nobody lives in the oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no daily high and low temperatures out in the middle of, of the ocean except for on islands. Uh, Spia, tell us, how, how do they measure that? You talk about these things that go way down and they pop back up. Oh, Explain it's, that. it's incredible. Yeah. So this is a huge change since, since I've been in the field. Um, there are a network of thousands of these um, instruments called Argo floats. Uh, the Argo floats are oh, about, about that big. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they, you toss them off the back of a ship. They control their own buoyancy. So they... Uh, blow out air and they sink to a particular depth and then all the time 24 7 while they're down there they're measuring temperature salinity and pressure okay and they're just carried along passively in the current and after a certain period of time it's about three weeks uh, they use tanks of air and you know reinflate pop back up to the surface it could be from thousands of feet down right and then they find a satellite and telemeter all that information that they've collected over the last three weeks and then they, you know, blow out there and sink back down and do it again. How long have these been around? Uh, about 20 years. Okay. So they're, uh, of course, more and more and more all the time. Uh, but we now have measurements all over the world ocean, uh, thousands and thousands of feet from the surface down to, I don't know, 10,000 feet down. 
And these are, are these all deployed by the United States, or is this a global? It's a global network. Okay. Uh, the United States does many of them. Right. Uh, but we, we cooperate with many other countries to do this. And speaking of other countries, um, you've traveled internationally to talk about climate issues. Uh, are we unique in the United States with our level of uh, skepticism on whether uh, climate change is being caused by the increase in carbon dioxide? We're certainly, um, we have more uh, public skepticism about this issue than other countries in general. Um, Australia, the UK, other English-speaking countries seem to be um, sort of our co-travelers in this way. Mm -hmm. um, but many, many countries uh, really are much more concerned about climate change than our country is. Well, assuming that uh, you talked about the amount of forcing, which is what the, the four watts around the globe, right. that's the forcing, so you're, you're adding energy, you're adding heat to the system. That's it. Now that doesn't mean it won't still be a snowstorm, won't be cold once in a while, but right. overall globally it's going to be warming Warmer. up. And if uh, we see that warm up at uh, a thousand times the rate that we did coming out of the last ice age, 500 to a thousand times, uh, uh, yeah, we will see in two centuries what took us 10,000 let, let, years. Let's say a hundred times okay. instead of a thousand times. So, so um, at the end of the last ice age, um, starting about 18,000 years ago, warmed up globally about five degrees Celsius, which is about nine degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So if some places wor warmed up a lot more than that, right? The middle of the ice sheets warm warmed up three or four times that much. Okay. Uh, but but a huge part of the world is the tropics, and it didn't warm up very much at all. So the average temperature of the world came up five Celsius in 10,000 years, 100 centuries for five Celsius. And under a sort of no policy, let's just burn it all kind of uh, future, we could warm up five Celsius in, a, in one century. Okay. So that's a hundred times faster than we warmed up coming out of the Ice Age. And I, I've seen different estimates, but at least a half a billion people live within a few feet of sea level. Yeah, more than that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's something like half the world's population lives within five meters of sea level or so, something like that. Now, if the sea level rises uh, 10 feet in 100 years. That's a lot. Yeah, let's say five feet. We'll, we'll cut it in half. Uh, in Denver, we move that step at the Capitol up a few notches that says you're now officially a mile above sea level. Yeah. But uh, we're talking tremendous challenges that we'd have for infrastructure and for uh, yeah, that, refugee situations worldwide. That's right. Uh, you know, people have probably seen these um, animations that show the sort of blue you know, line right. cre creeping in right. in New York and in London and in Shanghai and, and uh, all over the place. Uh, of course, here in the United States, it's probably uh, New Orleans, uh, Miami, Norfolk, Virginia, New York City. These are sort of the immediate um, places that sea level rise uh, hits hardest. Somebody has just asked my ears, is there any way we can refreeze it? <laughs> Let's finish talking about sea level rise for a minute, then sure. we'll come back to this okay. refreezing. Um, so even though uh, that's pretty scary, the idea that, that the ocean is just higher permanently, um, probably the more important thing is that when the ocean starts from a higher base, a bad storm that, rate, that, that has a storm surge of 10 feet, right. uh, if it starts from three feet higher, that's like a 13-foot storm surge from before. You see what I mean? Which we certainly saw with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, Hurricane Sandy York in New York City. So, so I'll take two questions. Then. Uh, obviously, that, your storm surge is going to be higher, sea level higher. You're going to have refugee issues. Right. You're going to have a lot of infrastructure. I know the military is concerned about this with the naval bases. Um, and it's not the sea ice, because that's like ice in your glass. That's it's right. It's the land ice in Greenland and Antarctica yeah. if you, if you melt sliding in. sea ice, nothing happens to sea level. Right. But if you melt ice that was on the land, that water runs into the ocean and raises the, the level of the ocean. Although, if we melt the Arctic ice cap, then instead of having bright, reflective ice, you have dark ocean, water, which right. absorbs... And we already are having that yeah. in a big way. That, that's already happening uh, really dramatically in the Arctic now. Um, but uh, as to refreezing the land ice, um, you might be able to do something really drastic 
to prevent it from melting, but I don't think you could refreeze it. You could, no. you could for example, uh, put styrofoam over the glaciers to, to insulate them in the summer. Uh, and then take the styrofoam off in the winter. But, you know, that would Got be... on a glacier? <laughs> they that, are pretty big. That'd that, be a lot of well, styrofoam. And, and ice sheet is the size... <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Antarctica is the size of, of the United States. Right. So uh, it's a lot that of styrofoam. That kind of flows into that the, the geoengineering right. topic that comes right. up. And one of the issues that I've heard in talking about it is, well, you, you, they've talked about putting a fine mist of... Of aerosols in the atmosphere, right. which when people do talk about back in the 70s, you guys said we were having global cooling, which is kind of a fallacy because uh, there were a couple of articles printed, made it on Time and Newsweek and a couple of books. But even at the, at the time of the 70s, because that's when we were in doing our atmospheric science, um, we, the preponderance of articles said, no, 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 the CO2 is going to vastly overwhelm yeah. any uh, dust in the atmosphere. But obviously a volcano cools the earth for a short amount of time, so aerosols the dust falls it. down, yeah. that's right. But the problem is keeping the aerosols up there, and still, if you continue to increase the CO2, you're still making the oceans more acidic. Yeah, so, so th there's several things that you just mentioned. So, so um, rather than aerosol, because everybody thinks we're talking about spray cans, I, I'd rather talk about particles, okay? So little, yeah. little teeny particles of dust. Yeah. And when volcanoes spew this stuff way up in the stratosphere, it reflects some of the sunshine to space. And then over about five years, they settle back down. So right. we had this with Mount Pinatubo in, in mm -hmm. the 90s. Um, now you could do this. Uh, you, could, you could make artificial volcano dust right. in, in the stratosphere. Um, there, there's, the biggest problem with it is that it's a surface. It's, it's literally a little tiny surface that chemical reactions happen on. Right. And those are the chemical reactions that destroy the ozone. Oh, well, that's a problem. So it is a yeah. problem. Yeah. So we don't really want to do that. Because we have had some success after the Montreal Protocol in 1988 of eliminating the CFCs that, that, and the, that we're ozone destroying the ozone layer starting to heal. That's correct? right. Slowly. It is. It, it is, it's uh, less and less every year, the, yeah. the hole in the ozone. Uh, and probably in about 50 years, that problem will be completely gone. So there's one that is solvable. Now, somebody did ask about, is there a way to neutralize the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Or I guess that also lead into sequestration where you could sure. bury it back into the ground. So, so the fundamental problem with that is that uh, the reason we put CO2 into the atmosphere is we get energy by putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Right. Taking it out of the atmosphere uses energy. It takes energy. Yeah. So, uh, where are you going to get the energy to take all the CO2 out of the atmosphere? Well, we could burn coal. Oh, wait, yeah. that, that's kind of yeah. a problem. See, That is, in order to, to make a, a coal-fired plant sequester the carbon, you uh, cut the efficiency of the plant way down. Well, by about, by about a third. Yeah. So it is feasible. So, so a lot of people ask me about taking CO2 out of the air. And just grabbing you know, random molecules out of the air is incredibly energy intensive. It, okay. it takes a tr tremendous amount of energy. If you had that much energy, problem solved, right? Because we've got, uh, we're no longer putting CO2 in the air. The, the place that's easiest to take it out of the air is in a smokestack, right. where it's not 400 molecules it's in much... a million, it's 200,000 molecules okay. per million uh, molecules. So 200,000 ppm in a smokestack uh, much cheaper to, to, to mine it out of that, if you see what I mean. Sure. It takes about one third of the energy that you make in the coal plant, uh, but you can basically scrub all the CO2 out. Now, at that point, you've got this liquid CO2. Right. You gotta do something with it. Uh, you could definitely do this for a single coal plant, and maybe even a thousand coal plants. Um, people have talked about train cars carrying the stuff to depleted oil reservoirs and, and then pumping you're it down. You're also burning car uh, carbon yeah. fuels to get the trains there. And but don't they already use CO2 to... Um, enhanced oil recovery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, there... you, you, you pump it in uh, to the rock uh, porosity and it forces the oil and gas uphill uh, to where the, the wells are. Not the same, but kind of a similar thing with hydraulic fracturing as yeah. you're, you're breaking very, it out. Very much similar. Does it stay there? Yeah, well, just as oil and gas have stayed there for 100 million years, okay. the CO2 will stay down there. Um, but, but you couldn't do this for all the fuel um, coal plants in the world because you'd have so much of this liquid CO2, there wouldn't be any room to, to stick it in the rocks. You see okay. what I mean? There's, you you got to literally figure out where to stuff that CO2. <laughs> so it, it 
can technically be done right now, yes. but it's not. Not and it's much easy. cheaper to do other things. Right. Such as? Such as solar power, wind power, hydropower, nuclear power. Are you talking fission at this point? Yeah. Because I did just see that in the new spending bill that the amount of dollars for fusion research has been cut by 30%. Well, at so... At least that was the proposal. I, I, I don't know your recollection of these things, Mike, but since I've been... Uh, since I was a little boy... F commercial fusion power has always been 25 Five years, years away, away. <laughs> so m maybe it still is I, I don't know well but uh, when I talk to grade school kids and we talk about this and I'll let you finish this up because uh, I think we'll probably uh, wrap this up in a couple of minutes but uh, I hold up my cell phone and I say to the kids first I talk briefly about carbon dioxide and how it all works you, you can't keep third graders for an hour talking about climate change I'm sorry uh, they want to talk about tornadoes and hail yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. But I do mention about climate change and um, that it's a real problem. But then I hold up that phone and I say to the kids, you know, this didn't exist 15 years That's ago. That's right. And it has the power of a supercomputer from yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. And so we don't know in this audience of eight-year-olds what geniuses there are that are going to come up with the chemistry or the engineering, yeah. the inventions that will change the world. And, and this is how our world has changed over and over again o over the last 500 years, right? Um, economists estimate that it's going to cost about 1% of the global economy to convert from our current energy system to an energy system that doesn't put CO2 in the air. And 1% of the global economy is a lot of money. I'm not, not soft pedaling that. Yeah, but there's 99% of that. There's the other 99%. Right. But let, let's think about some other things that cost 1% of the global economy over the last 100 years. When my grandparents were young, they uh, ripped up every street not them personally, but their generation ripped up every street in, in the developed world and put in sewer lines. They knocked out tenement walls and put in hot and cold running water. They, they knocked out every uh, indoor partitions in every apartment and put in toilets and sinks and showers. And boy, are we happy they did that. Yes. Uh, another, another thing that same generation did was rural electrification, running separate little copper wires to every house in Kansas and Nebraska. Imagine what that cost. Um, my parents' generation, did the interstate highway system. They won the Cold War. They sent people to the moon. Right. All of those things cost 1% of the global economy, and, and none of those things made them broke. In my generation, as you say, we did computers, the internet, the cell phones, and each one of those things is sort of a 1% of the global economy kind of investment. Now, I would say we don't have to choose between progress and prosperity. Progress is prosperity. That's what's made our uh, civilization do so well over these last centuries. We just have to keep doing what we've been doing and, and be brave and inventive, just like our parents and our grandparents' generation. I think we've got it right there. Scott, thank you so much. I oh, appreciate uh, your time. Uh, Professor Denning is always very uh, willing thank you to uh, answer questions that people send in to me. So if you think later, oh, I wish I had a thought to ask that. My email address is very simple. It's just mike.nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N, at kmgh.com. Or you can go to my Facebook page, which is just Mike Nelson 7 News, and send me a question. And uh, if I can't personally answer it, Professor Denning would be happy to answer it. It's a, it's a complex subject in some ways because the, what we're going to do about it is the biggest challenge. The science is actually, as you said, it, it's pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. It's serious, but it's but solvable. It's solvable. Yep. Thank you. Professor Denning, thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll try and do these periodically, and we really appreciate your taking the time to watch and, uh, and having some good questions to ask. It's an important subject, and uh, we'll continue to... Uh, to push forward on this. So have a great evening. We'll see you soon.